quantumlaserpointers.com. Quantum Laser Pointers brings you the infamous double slit experiment right in the palm of your hand. In 1801, English physicist Thomas Young performed this experiment to determine if light was a particle or a wave. A laser shines a coherent beam of light through a film disc containing two parallel slits. Light striking the wall behind the slits produces a classic interference pattern. This surprising result means light passes through the parallel slits not as particles, but as waves. When the peaks of two waves overlap, it creates a band of light. When the peak of one wave meets the valley of another, light is canceled out. Variations of this experiment spurred public debates between Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr on the true nature of reality. It's been called the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness. This convenient and affordable double-slit laser was designed for personal enjoyment and education. Visit our website or subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Be among the first to see our new line of double slit lasers, quantumlaserpointers.com. Uh, I would recommend uh, in a future conference like this that we have tissue boxes that we can give uh, out because we've seen many things that your mirror neurons are responding to. Uh, when you see someone going through an emotional circumstance, your brain responds in the same way. So I've used up all my tissues. Uh, the other day we heard uh, Francois, otherwise known as Frankie Peanuts, talk about uh, an unusual experience with Nelson Mandela where uh, after he left the room, the members of his team felt the presence of Nelson still there. Uh, from uh, Tansir, Tansiri, we heard about uh, she had bad feelings, and other members of her team had bad feelings the day before she was shot in, in Iraq. And the Waz told us that in some of his inventions, he got uh, information and ideas out of nowhere. His intuition worked really well. So these are relatively common human experiences. We get information that seems to come out of nowhere. Uh, some people have a kind of charisma that's, that has a palpable presence, even when they're not in your presence. These are the kinds of things that, uh, when surveys are taken around the world and through all cultures, all levels of education, people report having these kinds of experiences, either something they personally have felt or someone that they know. This is the kind of research that my colleagues and I do. There, our institute was started by uh, Edgar Mitchell, who was the Apollo 14 astronaut and the sixth person to walk on the moon. So he's a scientist and in a technical environment, but on the way back from the moon to the Earth, he had a mystical experience, which he didn't recognize what it was at the time. He later learned it was a form of samadhi, kind of a mystical experience. And so our institute is devoted to the idea that there are many ways of knowing. And the word noetic comes from the Greek root word nous, which means to know. But there is rational knowing, and there are other forms of knowing, including intuition and psychic and mystical forms of knowing. So we apply the tools of science to try to understand these things better. My talk will probably not make you cry. If, if anyone actually starts to cry as a result of my talk, then I'm probably not doing it very well. So let's see. So I'm talking about mind-matter interaction. You may have a slightly different title in your book, and I changed it to specifically focus on the notion of intention and matter. Does it matter what happens in your head in terms of the outside world? So here's a, a famous trick. Uh, I won't describe how the trick works, but at it's, it's the uh, question period, maybe someone can ask me, I'll tell you how it works. Uh, this is a form of levitation, but obviously a trick form of levitation. It's not quite so easy. Uh, here I am in Paris a couple of months ago, and this is a, a, a well-known uh, thing to do in the streets of Paris and elsewhere. This is a slight variation on the same theme, the form of levitation. Tricks, although in the real world we don't see it quite as, as large as this. And is, is uh, possible to do this kind of experiment 
in the laboratory, and it has been done, and it actually works. It doesn't work as strong as uh, Obi-Wan shows, but it does work to a small degree. And so what I, the reason I'm showing all this is to remind you that even though I'm talking about strange things like psychokinetic effects, the effect of mind on matter, that these are the things that usually come to most people's minds when they think about these phenomena. This is the big stuff. This is Hollywood way embellished beyond reality. But the reason why these things stick and why they're so popular uh, is because many people get a sense that there's something behind there, some, some truth behind these stories that actually is real. And so I'm going to talk about the real stuff and not the Hollywood stuff. And this then raises the question, how do we discern fact from fiction when we're dealing with these kinds of phenomena, especially given that people are rightly skeptical about these, these things. When you go on the street, you see somebody levitating and you know it's not real. You may not know how the trick is done, but how do we tell? So that's the kind of work that I do. And so the way that we go about it is we take stories, like the story from uh, Frankie Peanuts. So Nelson Mandela has a strange presence. Well, what do we do about that? Well, we, we simply take all of the stories and we start going through the stories and see if you can find a conventional explanation for why you get these effects. So when you do that, roughly half of the stories that people describe as being psychic or extraordinary are coincidence. And this is largely because people underestimate the likelihood that various things are going to happen. Uh, a large chunk are also confabulation. And this is basically you, you, you misremember. Your memory is slightly distorted and you remember the wrong thing. Some of it is definitely fraud. People make up these stories because they want to gain attention or they want to gain money. Some of it is selective memory. We tend to remember things that are interesting and forget the rest, but there's always a residue. So this is where it becomes interesting from a scientific point of view because these are anecdotes where every other form of explanation doesn't work very well. And so that's, that's when we start getting interested and see if we can bring it into the laboratory. So what is the something else? Rather than thinking of uh, the kind of work that we do as the paranormal or the supernatural or spooky this or that, what we're really talking about here is what is the role of consciousness in the physical world? And this is a tough problem because science doesn't yet know what consciousness is. The nature of awareness is a major mystery. No one knows. And it's also recursive, as illustrated here by this drawing, that it's, it, this is the act of consciousness, like what's going on, the awareness in your head, trying to understand itself. That is a recursion problem, and it's extremely difficult to figure out, which is why we don't know what it is yet. And so now the, the clicker, we need our mind over matter to make the next slide <laughs> appear because it is not working. New battery, perhaps? We need energy here. <laughs> yeah, clicker's not working. New clicker? Oh, Oop. Now, now we've killed PowerPoint. Someone is thinking bad thoughts. <laughs> oh, oh. So we lost PowerPoint. Oh well. So well. Yeah, it's the recursive problem. That's that's part of the issue here. So what I'm gonna I'm talking then about. Uh, the role of consciousness in the physical world. That's the way that I think about the program that we're doing, which is in basically the physics of consciousness. And when we get our slides back, you'll see that the way that we can begin to think about this from a scientific perspective is that it doesn't involve things coming out of your head. The usual way people think about what, how is it possible that your mind can influence the world around you without actually pushing it with your fingers. The, the first thing that people think of is that there's some kind of force that comes out of your head. And this has actually been checked. People have looked for forces for many, many years, and no forces are ever found. We see effects. We see that your intention can change the world, but not force-like. Well, what else is going on then? Let's see if we can go to the next. So one possibility is uh, that there's something about the brain 
that is at work here. There are conscious and unconscious elements of the brain. Uh, maybe we have other kinds of bodies. There are many traditions, esoteric traditions, that talk about a physical body and a light body and other kinds of bodies. Uh, and ultimately, we want, to, we want to know, if you change your thoughts, can you indeed change your world? So Rajiv told us that uh, in his own story that he would like to do something and then magically it suddenly happens. Well, is that coincidence or is there something actually happening in the world? There are two major theories that go on here. The first one is the neuroscience theory, which basically says that you're nothing but a pack of neurons or that you're a machine made of meat. Well, surgeons know that we are a machine made of meat. It's all about putting the machine back together again, but that doesn't tell us what consciousness is. Nevertheless, within the neurosciences, this is the prevailing theory, that your sense of self, your consciousness, everything you think subjectively is a result of your brain activity, and that's the end of the story. But there is another theory, one of the much older theory, by the way, I'm, we'll call this mechanistic materialism, which is the scientific worldview. It's very successful. We can't exclude this as a possibility because it is so successful. But the second theory is this, that consciousness is fundamental in some way that we don't yet understand yet from a, from a scientific perspective. So what do we do then? We have stories of mind-matter interaction. Is it simply entertainment? It's superstition? It's magical thinking? Or is it something else? Well, that's the task at hand. It turns out that there have been many experiments over the years, both on living systems and also non-living systems. Uh, these are about 100 years old now, from, from about 100 years till today. Roughly 500 publications in peer-reviewed journals and about 2,000 experiments have been reported. One of the first was actually described by Sir Francis Bacon, who was one of the founders of modern empiricism. His idea, uh, written in this famous book, A Natural History in 10 Centuries, was that if you wanted to study, as he put it, the force of imagination, which by which he means intention. You want to study the role of intention in the physical world? How do you do that? You toss dice. Why? Because with, with dice you can use statistics, and remember this is 1627, he was already coming up with ways of testing whether or not your mind could influence the world at large. So 300 years goes by, and here's J.B. Ryan at Duke University doing experiments with dice. And of course, you can't give somebody dice and have them toss it because there are ways of faking. You can make certain numbers come up if you hold the dice. So he used machines to toss the dice. So this kind of experimentation went on for 50 years, roughly 1935, 1987. What you're looking at at 50% would be a chance result that people could not influence the dice. But as you see, the means on this are mostly above 50%, and the overall result is there. And you can see the error bars. So this is way above chance. And in fact, you do the statistics on it. I did a meta-analysis a number of years ago. So when you look at all of the studies weighted by quality, the odds against chance is a gazillion to one. So people with many, many, many repeated trials and independent experiments show that you can indeed affect the roll of dice. This doesn't mean that the casinos are in trouble because the house take in casino games is so much greater than the effect size here that all the, the very worst that they're going to do is lose a little bit less, uh, or actually you will end up losing slower than you would if you were not using your intention. So the casinos have nothing to worry about. In fact, the casinos like this kind of information because it gives people the idea that maybe they could win simply by willing it, and most people, that's not gonna happen. So, uh, another long-term experiment using physical objects, this is um, Bob John and Brenda Dunn from Princeton University who had a lab that went almost 30 years. And one of their experiments used this big device, it's about 10 feet tall, it had 3,000 little polystyrene balls in it. And the polystyrene balls would fall down through pegs and they would create a normal curve at the bottom. And your task, that's what the, the thing looked like, this is what uh, the different bins at the bottom look like after many, many thousands of control runs. It looks supposed to be a normal curve and it's very, very close to normal, but you ask somebody while the balls are falling down to slightly push them to the right with your mind. In fact, they got pushed to the right. You push them to the left, they move to the left. And when you're not trying to do anything, they stay in the middle. So this is statistically speaking a very significant result. In terms of how much 
the magnitude was. It's not like you could see it happening. You could only see it statistically, but with enough data, you can see that there is actually an effect going on. So how is it possible? Do we have force beams coming out of our head? As illustrated in the comic books, this is the way we think of it. There's light, lightning strikes out of your head. It makes housework a snap. So how, how do we begin to even understand this? Up until recently, there wasn't any explanation. One of the reasons that this kind of research was considered out on the fringe somewhere is not through the empiricism, because there's plenty of data. It is completely uh, uh, a question about how do you begin to answer this in a scientific way without having to develop entirely new kinds of ideas. So in order to answer this question, we need to leave our senses. And what I mean by that is that common sense is, the, is not going to answer the question. Our common sense is an extremely thin slice of the world at large. And if there's one thing that science has taught us over the years is that what you perceive with your eyes and, and the, with your body and so on, that's a very, very small part of the world. And it's one of the reasons why it took the germ theory of disease basically a century before people understood that maybe you should wash your hands before you eat or do surgery. It took a long time because people could not see the germs. So there are many aspects of the world that are way beyond our ability, our common sense ability, and it's only through the development of instruments that we're able to actually see things that the world is much larger than we, th than we thought. So we will now leave our senses. We're interested in studying the nature of consciousness and awareness. You can think of this, not consciousness in the large sense, but simply what does it mean to be aware? Where does that come from? Well, taking a scientific approach, we try to find the source of it, which seems to be inside your head. We, go to, we start using reductionism and we look at neurons, we look at the, the synapses. We go further down, you find DNA, and then you find uh, atoms and, or molecules, atoms, below atoms. Uh, you start to find quarks, and then you ask, well, what is a quark? A quark ultimately is a mathematical construct. No one has ever actually seen a quark. It's a construct. So what is this mathematical construct all about? It's basically stuff in your head. It's symbolic. It's things that your head made up. So we have this strange recursion. We're trying to understand the nature of awareness, and when you cycle all the way around using the scientific method, you end up all the way back inside the mind. Is its symbolism. And it's actually worse than that because when you start asking what is the, f the foundations of mathematics, it's set theory, and what's the foundation of set theory is the Aleph null or the null set. And so you start from awareness and you go all the way down to literally nothing. So this is why uh, Kurt Vonnegut said everything is nothing with a twist, or if you prefer, when I press this button, at first there was nothing, then it exploded. So this is one of the consequences and actually demonstrates the difficulty of trying to understand these kinds of phenomena, especially consciousness. So it, we're talking here primarily about the difference between or the boundary between the classical and the quantum domains. So as you go further and further down into the structure of matter, you find that the world starts to get very, very strange indeed. In the classical world, we're used to things like locality, which means that if you want something to move, you have to shove it. You have to physically push it. Strict causality means time only flows in one direction, and absolute reality means that the moon is there if you're not looking. It means that objects have real properties. None of that is true in the quantum domain. In the quantum domain, things operate non-locally, that you don't need any contact at all in order to have influences at a distance, that causality is only probable, which means you can have things go backwards in time, and that reality is only potential, that objects actually don't exist in the usual way of thinking of objects until they are measured or observed. There are no properties at all. So it's very difficult for us to think about what it is, what it's like down in the quantum world, which, by the way, is right here and right now. We are in it. We just don't perceive it very well, but it's... It's the fundamentals of the physical world that we're in. One of the other strange things, of course, is that elementary particles have, have multiple characteristics, waves and particles both. In, the, in the, our common sense world, it would be something like that. You could ski right through uh, a tree. So you take a little uh, machine that shoots little pellets, and you 
send the pellets through two slits. And uh, when you do that, you see many of them bounce off because they don't go through the slits. But the ones that do go end up with two slits on the other side. This is the famous double slit experiment. That's what would happen if you use things about the size of a pellet. But if you use electrons or photons or elementary particles, you don't get two stripes. You get a series of stripes. This is called an interference pattern. And this has been a major mystery. It's a way of demonstrating in a physics lab that elementary particles are both waves and particles. This, of course, works also if you send in one particle at a time. You send one electron or one photon at a time through two slits, you will end up with an interference pattern. This is the way of demonstrating that while the particle is there, it's a separate little object apparently, but it also has wave-like characteristics. So what do we do now? We Physicists have looked at this for many years and they decided that what they're seeing is the wave-like characteristic of matter and, and energy, both. And the dark bars here is what happens when you get constructive and destructive interference with waves. And so this is the reason why in the double slit experiment you have the alternating light and dark bars, just like it shows here. So with that in hand, uh, what we're actually happening in these kinds of experiments with double slits is that we're shooting probability waves. So it's no longer that profitable to think in terms of particles, but waves of probability or waves of possibility. This gave rise to Schrodinger's wave equation. You think of the deep physical reality as a series of possibilities rather than actualities. And that's the equation, and that has been estimated to account for roughly 30% of the world's economy. The quantum mechanics is uh, the basis of our communications, of our electronics, and so on. That is the best physical theory that we've ever had. So far, of the many experiments done to look at it, none of them have failed. So that, that seems to be the way the world is, even though common sense doesn't show the world that way, that is what's happening. And the, the, the part of it where we bring it back into the role of intention is this, that if you're not looking at a double slit experiment or you're not measuring the nature of the physical world, it behaves in the way that we just saw, that you get an interference pattern because it's wave-like. But the moment that you do look, it no longer behaves that way. It behaves like particles. So this immediately tells us there's something peculiar about the role of measurement or observation in quantum mechanics. That if you can see or get actually any information at all about the deep physical structure, it acts like particles, otherwise it doesn't. So this is a major mystery in physics. But it's relevant, I think, to, as you'll see here, here's the same double slit experiment using, uh, in this case, photons. But we're going to look, from a distance we'll look and we'll see which of the two slits does a photon go through? And when you do that, you see you end up with two bars. It's acting like particles. So this gives, gave me an idea of how we'd go about testing this. And other people have thought of this as well. It's related to the, what's called the quantum measurement problem. This is an unsolved problem in physics. And the problem is that you have some kind of a quantum system on the left, and you have some sort of a measuring apparatus, which could be your eye, it could be uh, an instrument of some type, and when you measure the quantum system, you entangle it. The mathematics, you do something called a tensor product, and you, all that you've done is created a more complex quantum system as a result of the measurement. So the system and the apparatus are no longer independent, they're now entangled. Well, I assume many of you have heard of quantum entanglement, but in essence, what it means is that if you have systems that interact and then they separate, they're no longer separate. They might seem to be separate, but they're really not. They share properties. So observation apparently collapses, so-called the quantum wave function. It makes the potential world into the physical world that we see. And that means uh, it raises this question of when does the wave function collapse during measurement? You have some kind of quantum system there on the left. You measure it in some way, maybe using a photodiode and then you measure it again, looking through your glasses. And so when does this stop becoming wave-like and turn into particle-like, into the world that we see? And the answer seems to be it has something to do with consciousness. 
And this is one interpretation of quantum mechanics, there are many others, but this one actually has a, a pretty strong uh, background in terms of who is proposing it. So here, for example, uh, this is uh, Eugene Wigner, a Nobel laureate physicist, who said that the very study of the physical world leads to the conclusion that the concept of consciousness is an ultimate reality. It follows that the being with a consciousness much have a different role in quantum mechanics than the inanimate object. So this is one person who said this about 50 years ago. And then somebody says, but aren't quantum effects so fragile that they can't have anything to do with living systems? And my Simpsons character, uh, Doppelganger, says, that's so 20th century. It's not true anymore. Why not? Because of the dawn of quantum biology. So older physicists, for many, many years, had said that quantum mechanics can't possibly have anything to do with consciousness or the brain or the body because we're too hot and we're too wet and you can't sustain quantum coherence, which is where all these strange quantum things come from. Younger physicists said, maybe that's true, maybe that's not true. So we're gonna look in, in living systems anyway, and it turns out that living systems not only have quantum effects, they require them in order to work the way that they do. So this is a new hot area of, of biology and physics, integrating both of them. And then the, uh, just very recently, we can turn up the weirdness. So you notice here that the, the, the knob here is, uh, goes up to 11 now on weirdness. And the reason is that there, as quantum entanglement is being studied primarily for use in quantum computing, new things are being learned. So this just came out a couple of weeks ago in New Scientist as a cover story, and this will explain it. Reality can be strange, especially at the smallest scales. But what causes it to be that way? Physicists used to pin it on quantum entanglement, but there may be a deeper source, quantum discord. When two photons are entangled, they share a sort of information link. Each has information about the other, and when that information changes, like when one of the photons is measured, that new information is reflected in the other photon, almost instantaneously. Any noise coming in from the outside removes information from the connection, until there's not enough left to maintain the link. But it turns out that entanglement is only one kind of connection that particles in the quantum world can have. Quantum discord is another. If entanglement is a perfect link, discord is a less than perfect link. It doesn't carry as much information, but still lets quantum particles interact in ways that classical particles can't. The more discord a system has, the stronger its quantum behavior, while a system with no discord behaves classically, with no quantum effects. So the amount of discord is what determines the quantumness of a system. And when two particles are linked by discord, it becomes possible to change one by manipulating the other. This means discord might be useful for things like quantum computers, which until now have relied on delicate entanglement to work. Quantum discord is more fundamental than entanglement, and scientists are only beginning to understand exactly how it gives rise to all the strangeness of the quantum world. But one thing seems clear, discord is more than just a way to link quantum particles. It's one of the rules that govern the most basic levels of reality. So this is very important. Quantum discord is more fundamental than quantum entanglement. It reveals that there are degrees of entanglement and that it's robust. This is not a fragile or a fleeting effect. It could be, it's here like all the time. Things are connected all the time to various degrees. And it's probably much more pervasive that we have quantum effects among us now that we're, we're only vaguely aware of but must be there. And for those of you who know about information theory, quantum discord basically is talking about mutual information. It's the sharing of informational structures between separate systems. This suggests to us that maybe when we're starting to think of this, does the observer really play an important role in fundamental physics? This is really the essence of the question of how could intention push the world around? Well, let's look at that in a little more detail. So we asked the experts. Now we're talking about experts who are physicists or philosophers or scientists who are interested in quantum mechanics. What do they think about this? It turns out that virtually all of the founders of quantum mechanics thought that the observer played an important role. And so this is roughly in the 1920s. 
It also was true in the 1950s. The leaders of quantum mechanics then too thought that there was something important about the observer that was it wrapped into quantum mechanics in some way, and also in the bottom two physicists are contemporary physicists who accept this as well. Even more interesting is uh, at a conference in 2011, the people who were present were specialists in the ontological foundations of quantum mechanics, meaning what the, well, how do we interpret what the quantum world is telling us about the world that we live in? And they were asked the question, how important do you think the observer is? So one answer was it's a complex system. It should play no fundamental role whatsoever. It does play a fundamental role in the application of the formalism or plays a distinguished physical role. And the majority of people said it plays a fundamental role. And this, this is reflecting of what does the mainstream say? The majority of the mainstream say, yeah, observation is extremely important to quantum mechanics, and that's where the door opens just the crack for a way to understand how intention influences the world at large. Another conference in 2013, specifically for people interested in quantum theory without observers. So these are people who think physics has nothing to do with observers or consciousness or anything else. The same questions are asked and a quarter of the people at that conference also agreed, even though it was a conference about no observers, observers are important. So how would you go about testing for quantum level mind matter interactions? Not things like levitation and spoon bending, but actual effects of mind on matter at the quantum level. Well, this has been done now f since the 1960s using quantum sources. The first one uh, was using radioactive decay, which is a quantum source. Most of the rest of them use Zener diodes, which I'll explain in a minute. They're using a property of, uh, called quantum tunneling. So these are different random number generators that use quantum events. Uh, the, the last couple here are commercial devices. The one that you can get now for about $50 is called uh, True RNG, and it's just a little uh, USB stick. It produces random numbers and based on quantum events, so considered to be truly random. So a Zener diode is based on quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling uh, can be metaphorically described like this. If you have a classical ball and you get a, a certain shove to get it over a hill, that you need a certain amount of energy to have the ball go over the hill. And if you don't provide enough energy, the ball simply won't get there. For a quantum ball, though, quantum phenomena also have wave-like properties, and waves aren't stopped by things like hills. So you can just poke it a little bit and it could just tunnel right through. It just teleports right through the hill. So that's a quantum phenomena on the right. That's how these random number generators work. They're based on quantum tunneling effects. So we do the following experiment. We take a random number generator. This is a true random system based on quantum uh, tunneling. All it knows how to do is create a series of zeros and ones, truly random. And so it creates a random walk. We give somebody a task to uh, aim high, to think thoughts high, to make the whole thing produce more ones than zeros, and to do this. So if it, that might be a result of an experiment, and that would be a success. They're trying to get more ones. And you repeatedly do this experiment. You tell them to aim high or aim low, and you see what does the random generator do. So that's one experiment. Well, this is the result of 12 years of this ex same experiment involving many, many people at Princeton University. And that's the result. There, people are asked to aim high. The devices produce more ones. And to aim low, produce more zeros. And to do nothing stays in the middle. So this involved many people, many years, but one laboratory. So when I was at Princeton, I worked with a, a colleague to see if other laboratories had been able to replicate this. And we found many examples where they could. We published a meta-analysis in Foundations of Physics. And then later, we, did the, we updated it and found almost 800 studies doing almost exactly the same experiment. We're trying to aim high or aim low, looking purely at the role of intention or will on a random event, supposedly random event, which it turns out doesn't behave quite so randomly when you're thinking about it. So the odds against chance overall here is, is a gazillion, a multiple gazillion to one. It shows very clearly that when you ask people to simply will that a physical system over there somewhere should behave in a different way than by chance that it does. The magnitude of the effect is really, really small. It is not big enough to allow you to levitate. It is not big enough to allow you to levitate a flea 
or even a, a baby flea. It's, we're talking down at the quantum scale, but nevertheless, it's a real effect. Uh, some uh, skeptical colleagues of mine in, uh, in Germany in 2006 again did a meta-analysis for a subset of these experiments, and they again found results that were significantly different than chance. So the, these are, for those of you who know about statistics, these are z-scores. So about uh, eight years ago now, I decided to bite the bullet and say, well, look, we, we know that the double slit experiment is the primary way of demonstrating the wave particle duality of light, and we can do an experiment where we ask people to make believe that their mind could act as a detector in this system, but at a distance. So people are simply asked to imagine that they could see the photons go through the double slit, and if the mind acts as a detector, then it will collapse the wave function, and we will get particles. That's, that's what we will see the behavior as particles. Otherwise, if the mind can't do that, you would get waves. You'd get an interference pattern. So that's the nature of this experiment. There I am working on the system itself. That's what it looks like when it's assembled. This is the camera. It's a 3,000 pixel line camera to measure the interference pattern. Uh, the double slit slide is inside this little holder. The, each slit is 10 microns, and they're 200 microns apart. So they're really, really tiny slits. And so when I ask people to imagine that you could put your mind in the vicinity of the slit and see photons go through the slits one at a time, people say, I can't do that. I can't imagine it. And I would say, well, just imagine you could shrink yourself down to about the size of a micron or smaller and slow time down in your imagination and imagine that you could see the photons go through the slits. So if people can't do that, then they can't do the experiment. So we did many pilot tests, uh, and the bottom line is there. So this dot here, uh, the, the zero line here, is what you'd expect by chance, and it's way below chance, statistically speaking. Uh, it turns out that meditators do much, much better than non-meditators. And the reason why we keep track of whether people are meditators or not is because the task involves focused attention. And meditation is all about attention training. So we figured that people who have attention training should be able to do the task better than those who do not, and that is indeed what we find. So strong statistical evidence that when you ask people to do this rather simple task, that the double slit device behaves differently. The particle, they, they we're seeing particle behavior rather than waves. And when no one is asked to observe the system, it behaves like chance. So that, and we then did a, a formal experiment where we selected people who appeared to do well in the first ex experiment and did ran them again through the experiment and we got even stronger results as compared to a control. So then we just said, since we're dealing with non-local effects, the quantum world, things are connected with far distances, not only through space but through time as well. Why don't we do an experiment over the internet where we have a double slit system set up but people can access the, the experiment over the internet and do the same task and see that way we can see whether distance makes a difference. So there's the, the setup, and there's two conditions that you would do in this experiment. You either get a blank screen where you're not observing anything, or you get a screen where you're seeing a squiggly line, and the squiggly line is giving you immediate real-time feedback from the double set itself. And the task is to make the line go up. If the line goes up, it is designed in software to reflect that the wave function is collapsing. That we're seeing more particles than waves. We also had a Linux box programmed to simulate a human. And the reason you do this is you want to make sure that if you get results in this experiment that it wasn't an accident. It wasn't an artifact. It wasn't something wrong with the equipment and so on. So we had a Linux box observing and doing the same thing as humans. And of course, the nice thing about that is that the, uh, the double slit system and the server that's sending bits out over the internet, it doesn't know if there's a human on the other end or a Linux box. And we're assuming that Linux boxes are not conscious. Uh, maybe the WAS would think that it was conscious, but probably not. So what the camera sees is an interference pattern. It looks like that. That's what the camera sees. And we're measuring something called fringe visibility, which is how sharp these fringes are. And it's a very simple equation looking at the peak and the trough of adjacent fringes. And so the prediction is that when we're, people are seeing the screen that gives feedback of the system, that the fringes will shrink. 
And this is, this is where the idea of collapsing the wave function comes from. You're collapsing the wave-like character of, of um, the quantum. So we predict uh, there will be a collapse of interference. This is the result of uh, all data collected in 2013. So when people are observing the 20 fringes that we measured all collapsed, and very significantly so, as compared to when the Linux box was looking and there was no collapse at all. So the nice thing about this as well is not only did we get a confirmation of what we saw in the laboratory, but we're able to test does distance matter? And so our laboratory is in California, and the, as the farthest away you can get from our lab is South Africa, and it's 18,000 kilometers. And we're able to look at all of the, d the dots here are individual trials in the experiment, somebody doing the experiment from some distance away. And the question is, is the slope of the line that goes through this different than zero? Because if the slope of the line is different than zero, then we're dealing with something like an electromagnetic force or some kind of force which would decline with distance. But the slope of the line here is zero to six decimal places. So we know that there's no difference. People in South Africa were getting the same result as people a kilometer away from our laboratory. So again, suggesting this really is a quantum effect. The observer effect is independent of distance. So we published this in a physics journal in 2012 and 13, and they have a couple of additional articles coming along. And I'm doing that to uh, inform the physics community that is still struggling with this basic problem of interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, that actually there are experiments that can be done, and we're doing, uh, that address the question. Does the observer make a, dis a difference or not? The answer is yes, it does. So then we, uh, some of our colleagues said, well, how do you know that it's really a quantum effect? Because after all, you're using a laser system, continual laser, continuous output, with trillions of photons per second. And that means that maybe it's quantum and maybe it's not. So we decided to do the same experiment using a single photon at a time. So it's a single quanta, one photon in the system at a time, and do the same kind of experiment as we did before. You can show uh, through this system that it really is operating in the quantum way, that you're getting interference even though one photon at a time is going through it. And you give it somebody a task where they're going to observe the system with their mind alone. And if, that, if it collapses the wave function, then interference will go away. And in this particular configuration, the trough will go up. So that's, that's what we're expecting in this experiment. So we also did experiments since we're interested in mind-matter interaction. We took EEGs, the brain waves of people, while they were doing the task to look for the correlation between brain activity and what's happening in the double slit. And I'm skipping over huge amounts of technical information here, but just to give you the bottom line, the bottom line is this, that the task, first of all, you're relaxing. You allow the person to relax, and whenever they get the sense that they want to interact with the system, they say, okay, they press a button, five seconds goes by where they're told to get ready, get ready to, to apply your intention to the system, and then they concentrate. So when they concentrate, what we find is that the double slit count rises, and that's what we we're hoping to see here, that the interference goes away and the counts at the trough begin to go up. At the same time, we find in their brain that their what's called alpha power drops, and this is an indication that they're concentrating. So we do see the more people concentrate on the system, the more the double slit system is making photons behave as particles. So th that's what we saw. We saw that portion of the interference pattern rise. In the latest experiment, we, we're calling it the Illuminated Buddha experiment. And this is because we have this little Buddha statue where we put an LED inside the Buddha. And the more that the system behaves like a particle, which would only occur by observing it with your mind, the brighter the Buddha gets. So if you can illuminate yourself, then the Buddha will be illuminated as well. And people like this experiment because it, this way we were able to take it out of the realm of doing a physics experiment and basically say, make this little statue get bright. And if you can do that, then you'd be succeeding. So people enjoyed this, and the results were very good. Statistically speaking, very little doubt that it actually was getting brighter when people are asked to make it brighter. So that's, that's what that is indicating there. Uh, that means, again, that individual photons were being affected by the mind at a distance. All right. 
So does the quantum observer effect prove that mind and matter interact? And the answer is no. It provides a new way to think about these effects from a scientific point of view, from basic physics, where you can do these kinds of experiments, which are, which are essentially physics experiments, demonstrating that there is actually a connection between the observer and the physical system. So if one mind interacts with matter at a distance, what happens when many minds work together? And this raises the question that we have addressed in the Global Consciousness Project, which looks at this question of what happens if everybody in the room tried to do the experiment rather than one at a time? Does it make a difference? Many of you may be aware that the, the Transcendental Meditation Society did experiments to look at the role of group meditation. Does it make an impact on society? And the answer, according to the, their studies, seems to be yes. The more meditators present, in this case in Washington, D.C., some years ago, the more that the uh, crime statistics went down. This was published in a very prominent journal, but basically had no impact in the world of science anyway, because people didn't believe it. Because at the time, and still actually, there isn't a really good explanation as to why it would work. Nevertheless, the, empirically, it looks like it makes a difference. We decided to take a different approach. Our approach was to say, well, if mind and matter were really related in some way, then collective mind and collective matter should be related as well. So if you have a period of mental order, like this was the opening ceremony at the Olympics in China, then there should be physical order somehow, somewhere. And likewise, if there's mental chaos, there should be physical disorder. Well, how do we measure this? Well, there are several different kinds of order that can appear in randomness. So there's one kind of order, and there's another kind of order. The way to, to measure these is to take samples of many, many samples like this and create distributions. So you can have like a squished curve or a tall curve. And we're basically asking for whom the bell tolls. Don't ask for the whom the bell tolls because it tolls for thee. In this case, the, bell to the, the bells that are tolling are the bell-shaped curves. This is called a field consciousness detector, and it's our familiar random number generator. We use it to generate noise, entropy. We use that to develop uh, bell-shaped curves. And now we see how the bell-shaped curves change when there are large-scale events involving lots of minds. So we're developing basically a tsunami detector, but not a tsunami detector in the water, as distributed here, but a tsunami in the ocean of consciousness. That's the metaphor that we use. And so we have detectors in these locations. Uh, there's one in Malaysia, there's one in Singapore, and everywhere else in the world, roughly 75. All that they're doing is random number generators continually pushing out random bits. That's all it does. Every five minutes, the random bits are shipped up to a server at Princeton. And what we look for, and this is Roger Nelson, who is the prime mover on this project. The events that we study are predictable events of mass interest and unpredictable events, both. So there's what the data looks like. Random data coming in, it's turned into bells, bell-shaped curves, and then a cumulative curve over a period of hours, typically. So here's an example. This was the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Uh, the dot there on September, uh, September 11th is when the attacks occurred, and the red line that deviates away is showing that the nature of randomness changed in the world. And we think as a result of the huge amount of attention that was placed on this event for that day and a number of days afterwards. Here's another example. The uh, earthquake in Indonesia, this was said to kill something like 50,000 people huge amount of attention and outpouring of uh, compassion around the world. Uh, Nelson Mandela dies. This was in uh, d December last year. Again, there is a deviation over the course, in this case, of one day because of the attention placed on this. And what we're talking about here is a change in the physical structure of the world itself. It was less random when lots and lots of minds were paying attention to this event. The World Cup, Germany versus Brazil, a lot of people paid attention to that and it had an effect. Uh, the election 2008 for Barack Obama. We know a few things about what makes a difference here. The level of emotion makes a big difference. The more emotion, the bigger the response that we see in our network. Uh, the more compassion, the bigger the response. Uh, so this is the result as of last month. 400 or two months ago, 472 big events around the world that attracted worldwide attention. 
overall, a, you can see where the expectation is, chance expectation, the grand mean of all of the events. Uh, and if you look at it cumulatively, it's a little bit easier to see. This is a seven sigma event, for those of you who know about physics, that's odds against chance of greater than a trillion to one. So we have very good evidence at this point that while this has nothing to do with things like group prayer, and nevertheless, the world does change physically when lots of minds think and are along the same wavelength. So that's a, a worldwide mind-matter interaction. There are many ways of, of looking at whether or not there's, this is a chance effect and this is not due to chance. So why don't you know about this? About, about, in fact, why don't you know about any of this, probably, unless you've read my books, uh, it's because of the same problem that Galileo had. That he's basically saying, look, here's something empirical, and people said, no, we don't, we don't want that. We will hit you with, with that. And uh, finally, I'm gonna end on the question of so what? So the things I'm talking about here are at the quantum scale. This is really small stuff. The really small stuff is important because your electronics wouldn't work without it, but nevertheless, what does it have to do with our daily lives? So one of the so what's is that, well, should we all be supermen? And the answer is probably not, because if we were, if we all had Jedi capacities, we would destroy the Earth real quick. Because we're, we're not internally centered enough, and our egos are still involved, that we, our desires would get expressed into the world, and there are many stories about this, ranging uh, from The Tempest by Shakespeare to Forbidden Planet, which is a movie showing that people basically would destroy themselves. So it's a good thing that our intention affects the world, but only to a small degree. Nevertheless, there are applications. One of them is healing. So Bill Benston will talk later about the role of intention or something to do with the mind in doing very significant healing. Another possibility is stimulating peaceful coexistence. There are many groups that are doing worldwide prayer on certain days. Does it make a difference? Our experiment says it's changing the physical world in a direction towards order. Now, I don't know whether that is exactly the same as peace, but it's doing something, and we hope it's doing it in a positive direction. Uh, this one, because I'm, I've run out of time, I think I'll, I'll skip it, but I'll only mention here that if you look at the amount of money and time that is used to develop new drugs, the vast majority of it happens in the beginning. Where in this case, you might go through 10,000 compounds in order to find a small number of candidates. But what if you used intention to reduce the search time? Like a lot of drug discovery involves select and mutate, select and mutate, select and mutate. You do it again and again and again. If your intention was, I want to find an antibiotic that kills this thing, kills, make, make an antiviral that kills Ebola, but you have people who are intending that this is the outcome, well, maybe you shave off 1%. 1% in this process is worth a huge amount of money, not to say for the practical benefit of it. This could obviously be used for novel ways of uh, controlling and uh, communicating. So we now, of course, brain-computer interfaces are pretty popular. Here we're talking about the same kind of control without any equipment at all, simply the mind controlling at a distance. And I'm going to end with this one, new kinds of food and beverage. So I did this with a colleague in uh, Taiwan uh, two years ago, and we're looking at the tea ceremony. The tea ceremony is interesting because it's a ceremony which revolves around the notion of intention, and specifically that through the intention, you're essentially expressing nurturance and love in the tea itself. So we said, okay, let's see if that does anything. Just like lots of religious rituals are all about intending and prayer on food and beverage, is this just because it makes you feel good or does it do anything? So we decided to test it. The way it worked was this. We made a, a big batch of oolong tea, separated it into two equal sizes. One batch was preyed upon by three senior Buddhist monks at a temple in Taiwan. And the, what they're impressing into the tea was the notion that people who drank the tea would feel more vigor, less fatigue, their mood would elevate. So then this was the, they were separated into little bottles, and then we gave the bottles to 100 people in each group, and each was asked to fill out at the end of the day their mood at the end of that day. The whole experiment took place in one week, 
because there are lots of things that modulate mood, and we wanted to make sure that all the people in the same city were going to be subjected to the same news and the same weather and all the rest of it. So we tried to, to balance it as best we could. And this is the result. First of all, we asked people, what do you think you were drinking? Because expectation strongly pushes mood. So we have people who are showing the change in mood for what they thought they were getting. If you thought you're getting the treated tea, the blessed tea, your mood went way up. You thought you're getting the untreated tea, the mood didn't change at all. And then there are people who just didn't know one way or the other. So this shows there is a big effect of, of expectation. And then the next thing is, we look at the, uh, the role of expectation, whether they got treated tea or not. So this condition here is called placebo control. So everybody here believed they're getting the treated tea. But the ones who actually got the treated tea did a lot better than the ones who did not. This suggests that even under double-blind placebo control, if you're getting tea that has been blessed by the Buddhist monks, your mood was better than if you got the untreated tea. The other conditions, there's called the nocebo control in the middle. These are people who believe that they were not getting the treated tea even though they were. And there, it's actually no different. And then the third category, people who didn't know what they were getting, they had no opinion. So the really interesting condition is this one. This is called placebo-enhanced condition because these are people who, all of whom are getting the treated tea, but some of them think they're getting the treated tea and others think they're not getting the treated tea. So under this condition, you get a massive difference. This is a 1,000% difference in terms of mood. So it's statistically very significant. What this says is that is there an, an effect, in this case by blessing tea, did that make a difference in mood? Yes. But it's modulated very strongly by whether you believed that you were getting that tea. So as, as you kind of make sense that even large-scale mind matter effects make a difference on what you expect to occur. So then to finish, if my button works, there we go, the conclusion is very simple. Mind matters in unexpected ways. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>